My handwriting is going to shit. I That's okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It gives me great pleasure to be a speaker at the International Trade Council's Think Global Conference 2021. This is an overview of the presentation today, and we'll be sometime at the end for questions, should you have any. Even if the term franchising is unfamiliar to you as a layperson, you would certainly have heard of popular examples of franchises, such as McDonald's, 7-Eleven, and the fitness franchise, F45. In developed market economy countries, the sales of goods and services to franchising has grown by leaps and bounds in the last five decades. By some estimates, franchising contributes more than a third of all retail sales in terms of US dollars. And the rapid growth and success of franchising has been attributed to a number of factors. The most important one probably being that franchising combines the depth and knowledge and the strength of one entity, the franchisor, with the entrepreneurial spirit of a businessman who is the franchisee. Franchising can extend to every industry possible whether it's hotels, or car tuning, or even dentistry. At its most basic level, a franchise agreement is an arrangement whereby one person, the franchisor, has developed a system of conducting a particular business, allows another person, the franchisee, to use that system in accordance with the stipulations of the franchisor in exchange for certain consideration. There are, therefore, three factors that typically characterize a franchise relationship. The first is a license to use the system. In return for an agreed payment, the franchisee is allowed to use the franchised system. The second is an ongoing interactive relationship. The relationship is ongoing in the sense that it involves multiple sales of the franchise product over a period of time, with the franchisor giving assistance from time to time to the franchisee to establish, to maintain, or to promote the franchise unit. And finally, you have the franchisor's right to prescribe the manner of operating the business. Um, these directions may include, for example, quality control, protection of the system, territorial restrictions, operational details, and a host of other regulations that govern the conduct of the franchisee in relation to the franchise. Let's go with an example of a fictional franchise entity. The company is called Arigato Inc., a restaurant that sells specialist Japanese food. One of the unique uh, attributes of Arigato is, of course, its trademark, um, the name Arigato under which the franchise will operate the restaurants. But more than that, there is a system for preparing and selling the food, uh, which are sold probably in large volume and in a uniform manner. There are therefore a number of other aspects that go into producing a product of consistent quality. These could include a good sighting or location for the restaurant, the design of the employees' uniforms, the design of the packaging, sourcing quality uh, sources for the supplies, uh, inventory of ingredients, and the management and accounting systems. There may be different types of franchises. For the purpose of this presentation, we will be dealing with one broad category, which is called the business format types of franchise, that is characterized by an ongoing business relationship between the franchise and the franchisee that includes not just the product, service, or trademark, but the entire business format itself. There are three types of a business format franchise. The first is a processing franchise. <clears throat> in this, a franchisor is supplying an essential ingredient or technical knowledge to a processor or manufacturer, and the franchisor grants the franchisee authorization to manufacture and sell products under the marks of the franchisor. In the second example, a distribution franchise, the franchisor manufactures and sells the product to the franchisees, and the franchisees are then selling the products to the customers un under the franchisor's trademark, but in their own geographical areas. In the third example, a service franchise, the franchisor develops a certain service which is to be rendered by the franchisee, but in accordance with the terms of the franchise agreement to the end customers. The franchisor may want to make a franchising program in a number of ways. Making the choice between the various possible structures depends very much on the particular facts and circumstances that exist in relation to the franchisor and the potential franchisees. But there are two broad examples of this unit franchising and territorial franchising. The most straightforward way to create a franchise is unit franchising. <clears throat> Typically, this arises only in domestic situations. 
that is where the franchisor and the franchisee are in the same country. And it allows the franchisor to replicate his business as efficiently as possible without having to establish new structures such as subsidiaries or joint ventures. If franchise is required to be established outside the borders of one country, which is what the Think Global Conference 2021 is all about, you will need a different type of franchise agreement. This is the territorial franchise agreement that can cover a substantial territory or geographical area by setting up simultaneously or successfully a number of different units, shops or outlets over a great period of time. There are generally two forms of setting up territorial franchises, which is the franchise developer agreement and the master franchise agreement. There's also a combined structures agreement, which we will get into in due course. In this type of agreement, there is a direct link between the franchisor and the franchisee, the latter being expected to open and operate several units. This franchise will therefore include a development agreement where the franchisee is required to develop the assigned area by establishing a number of franchise units or outlets, which he will usually own directly. In this case, it's important to note that the franchisee will not sub-franchise out to third parties. Then we come to the master franchise agreement, probably the most common form of international franchising. In this, the franchisor grants another party, usually called the master franchisee, certain rights which may be exclusive for a given geographical area. <clears throat> the master franchisee is given the right by the franchisor to grant further franchises to third parties, which are usually called sub-franchisees, to exploit fully the potential business opportunities in the larger geographical area. A franchise agreement may also be based on a combination of the structures discussed in the previous two slides. It may, for example, combine a master franchise under which a number of independent sub-franchisees will be established with a franchise developer agreement under which the same master franchise or one of his sub-franchisees is additionally committed to open a number of his own units in the same territory. Master franchise could also therefore be mandated to conclude franchise development agreements with one or more of the independent franchisees under the master franchise agreement. We will spend the second part of the presentation in analyzing some of the essential clauses within a franchise agreement that may be relevant. Do note that this is not to be considered as legal advice and particular and specific legal advice should always be taken where required to understand the objects and purposes of a given franchise agreement and to determine whether its provisions are appropriate or balanced. The typical provisions of a franchise agreement <clears throat> are essentially the rights and obligations of the franchisor, Second, the rights and obligations of the franchisee. And third, some of the miscellaneous provisions that you would see in contracts of this type. Let's get into those right away. The obligations of the franchise or to the franchisee can be divided into two broad areas. The first, of course, is the obligation to license intellectual property rights and other relevant rights that are associated with the system to allow the franchisee to use the franchise system. The second is really the obligation to communicate the franchise system to the franchisee to allow the grant of the franchise to actually have practical effect. <clears throat> in other words, the franchisor needs not just to grant a right to use the franchise system, but also explain how that system works. The obligation to grant an intellectual property license is at the heart of the franchise agreement. Without this license, the franchise system using its trademarks, trade name, trade dress, industrial designs, inventions, copyrights, or trade secrets, the franchise system wouldn't work. The franchisor is required to identify the various intellectual property rights associated with the system and the manner of their use by the franchisee in the contract. The second and most important obligation of the franchisor is in relation to the administrative procedures that are required in the country in which the trademarks are going to be used. <clears throat> this is because intellectual property rights are established and maintained in accordance with national laws of different countries. The agreement should specify very clearly whose obligation it is to take care of or to follow up on these administrative procedures in order to properly register and defend the marks in question. The franchise has certain obligations in terms of communicating the franchise system to the franchisee. There are four broad obligations. The first, of course, is the provision of the operating manual. In the case of the Japanese restaurant, Arigato, the operating manual would probably contain information on site selection for the unit, employee recruitment and training, accounting, supply and stock control, recipes, 
sales routines, etc. The second broad obligation is assistance in relation to selecting or approving the unit and actual opening in, in that particular country. The third would be the continued support that may be required uh, in terms of continuous improvement to the system, including the local modifications that may be required to take into account local market conditions and certain other cultural differences. The last obligation of the franchisor is in relation to training. And this is quite important because the franchisor would need to provide training to the employees of the franchisee in order to operate the franchise system successfully. This training can be divided into market training, processing training, and repair and general business training. The franchisee as well can be said to have four obligations that are divided into the following basic areas. Compliance with the development schedule, payment of the various fees that are required under the franchise agreement, compliance with certain requirements imposed by the franchisor to allow quality control, and finally, respect for confidentiality of the information that is provided. The first of these obligations is the obligation of complying with the development schedule. In the case of development franchises, and sometimes also in the case of master franchises, a development schedule is a very important feature as it specifies the number of franchise units, shops or other outlets which have to be opened, as well as the agreed time frame within which this must, must be done. Compliance with this is extremely important because not only will the income of both parties to the franchise agreement depend on the timely opening of the franchise units, but also depend on how quickly new customers are acquired and the extent of market share in that country. The second most important obligation is, of course, the payment of fees. The franchise agreement should specify all types of payments to be made by the franchisee to the franchisor, including any initial payment, which is sometimes called an entrance fee for granting the franchise, ongoing royalty payments, payments for advertising and promotion that is undertaken by the franchisor, security deposits, or any other types of payments. More specialized fees may sometimes be required for circumstances of franchisees that are unique to a particular type of franchise system. The third obligation of the franchisee is the obligation of compliance with quality control requirements. The franchise's control of the manner in which the franchisee operates the franchise system is quite important to ensure operations are properly carried out and that the intellectual property rights that are owned by the franchisor are protected adequately. Sustaining the reputation and goodwill of the franchise's distinctive signs and, and trade dress is in the interest of both parties. While it's clear that the franchisor must impose quality control requirements on the franchisee to protect both parties' interests in the system, care should also be taken to ensure that requirements do not violate, for example, national competition laws, which is probably a separate topic. The last and final obligation of the franchisee is the obligation in relation to confidentiality. And this extends from everything from the trade secrets of the franchisor that are disclosed to the franchisee, as well as any other information that may be disclosed and is disclosed under the agreement. Any franchisor would have spent a great deal of time and energy in developing the franchise system, and this is contained to a large extent in the operating manual. Therefore, it is essential to the maintenance of the trade secrets of the franchisor that the operating manual and other information of confidential nature are indeed kept in confidence. Having dealt with the obligations of the franchisor and the obligations of the franchisee, there are a number of other miscellaneous provisions in a typical franchise agreement that are probably more unique to such arrangements than other commercial agreements. Let's get into each one of these in detail in the following slides. Exclusivity is a really important concept in the context of franchise agreements. A franchisor may decide as to whether a franchisee is limited by some fashion to a specific geographical area or for a specific period of time uh, to run the franchise arrangement. This is to protect the franchisor from a situation where the franchisee has complete control in relation to the franchise operating in that particular jurisdiction. Different degrees and sorts of exclusivity may also be considered for the purposes of franchising. For example, a franchisee may be accorded exclusively to sell certain goods or provide certain services to the general public, but the franchisor may have reserved for himself or for other franchisees the sale to certain specific types of customers, such as hospitals or armed forces establishments. The parties to a franchise agreement normally decide to set a certain 
period on the agreement, subject to premature termination on the occurrence of certain activities. The term should both be long enough for both parties to derive some benefit from the agreement if it is not reviewed, mainly owing to the very high investment of time in terms of training and the starting costs of the franchise unit. In particular, the franchisee is required to make a significant investment, such as in land, business, buildings, assets, and in inventory. This justifies giving the franchise agreement a longer term than usual. But at the same time, the term should still be short enough for the parties to severe the relationship within a reasonable period of time, should the arrangement not work out for any reason. As with any other commercial arrangement, there should be flexibility provided in the document to terminate the relationship if one or both parties are dissatisfied with the agreement. This could be broken into two different scenarios. The first being a breach of the agreement by the franchisor, while the second is situations where there is a breach of the agreement by the franchisee. At the same time, in order to protect his interest in the franchise system, as well as his interest in ensuring a steady income, the franchisor will probably wish to secure the right to terminate the franchise upon the occurrence of certain events, which would be called material breaches, the first one would be the failure of the franchisee to operate the franchise properly. For example, if the franchisee is not meeting a certain sales quota or target that has been agreed, or if the franchisee were to become insolvent, or if the franchisee was to breach a confidentiality requirement, or would be underreporting royalties or failing to pay them when they are due, all of these would be circumstances under which the franchisee would typically have a right to terminate the contract. If a breach of the aforementioned kind does occur and it is possible to correct it, the franchisee should be given an opportunity to do so. Failure to correct the material breach within the remedy period that's provided would usually result in a termination of the contract after this period is completed. If the franchise or breaches an essential provision of the agreement, the franchisee should generally have the option of terminating the agreement and claiming redress. The definition of material breach usually relates to one of a few things. Uh, the first being the franchisor's trademark being invalidated for any reason, because the license to use the trademark is a very important part of the franchise system. The second would be a supply of substandard products by the franchisor to the franchisee, where high quality products are essential to the franchise's operation. This would be considered a material breach. The third would be a failure to fulfill any promises um, and, and such promises are usually given a breach period <clears throat> or a remedy period, uh, for example, 30 days for the franchise or to remedy the situation, failing which the franchisee can terminate the agreement. Termination usually occurs when the term of a franchise agreement comes to an end and the agreement is not renewed, or if the agreement is terminated before its normal expiration because a material breach has been committed by either the franchise or the franchisee. Agreements can also be terminated prior to the expiry by mutual consent between the parties. Upon the occurrence of any kind of termination, a very important consideration is what are the rights and obligations of the parties upon such termination. Upon termination of the agreement, the former franchisee is no longer entitled to use the intellectual property rights that were licensed to the franchisee. This is because the rights that have been granted to or registered by the franchisor are for a limited period of time that come to an end along with the termination of the agreement. At the same time, if there were amounts that were due, the franchisee must be aware that monies that are paid by him for advertising and promotion of the marks and trademarks and the trade names used in the territory, may those obligations would also end along with the termination of the franchise agreement. The main reason for including in the franchise agreement a post-termination restriction is because the franchisor, having taught the franchisee how to operate a successful business in a different territory, does not want the franchisee to then compete with the franchisor using the same system or elements of the franchise system. What is also relevant is the interest of the franchisor to be left in a position to offer something to new franchisees who may wish to step in and take over the franchise for that territory. Such non-compete restrictions, however, have certain limitations. The first limitation is the question of the length of time. For the size of the geographical area in which a former franchisee can be precluded from competing, it should generally match the market area in which the franchise unit operated. Another restriction which have, will have to be assessed for, for its reasonableness is that relating to the type of business that the former franchisee is precluded from operating. For example, a restaurant franchisee could be restricted from operating the same type of restaurant in the same venue after the franchise is terminated. However, such restrictions will probably not apply if that restaurant owner were to open up 
a different concept restaurant or one in a different location. It is typical for franchise agreements to have provisions in relation to the transfer of the agreement. These would occur typically in two different cases. The first is a sale by the franchisee. It would seem that if the franchisee had developed a successful franchise and wishes to sell it to a willing buyer at a price that includes a profit for himself, then he would ordinarily have the right to do so. However, usually the franchisor's consent is required prior to the sale. And in certain cases, the franchisor may also charge a fee in order to provide such consent. In the case of a sale by the franchisee, when the franchisee, if a natural person, dies and the ownership of the franchise passes to his heirs, if the franchisor can establish that the heirs are incapable of operating the business properly in the same manner as the original agreement required, then the franchisor should have the right to repurchase the franchise at a fair market price. The next miscellaneous provision is in relation to the renewal of the agreement upon the expiry of the initial term. The question of renewing the franchise on terms that would be fair to both parties does present certain difficulties. If the franchisee is successful, he would like to continue the arrangement under exactly the original conditions, including payment terms. At the same time, if the franchisee is more than successful, the franchisor may want to benefit from that increase in value by raising the commercial benefit that arises to the franchisor under the original agreement. The franchisor would therefore usually grant a renewal on the same terms as being offered to new franchisees, but with every renewing franchisee, the franchisee may not be required to pay another initial fee on renewal because the franchisor would not have to incur the investigation and training costs all over again. Let's summarize once again the essential principles of franchising and why it makes sense to franchise. Going back to the example of our Japanese concept restaurant, Arigato Inc. If Arigato would like to expand its business to other geographical areas in other countries, it has two options. One, it is to open new restaurants itself, but in this case, there are two disadvantages. The company would be required to raise the necessary capital for such expansion itself. It would also be required to understand and appreciate the local cultural differences and business practices and customer preferences in each market. On the other hand, if Arigato were to consider franchising, this would present certain benefits in the sense that it would not have to raise capital for the construction of new restaurants. The franchisor can obtain new markets for the distribution of its goods and services, in this case, Japanese food, with minimal capital expenditure. At the same time, Arigato would not have to raise capital to finance a recruitment of staff to operate the new restaurants, as well as to manage a larger corporation that would be necessitated by such expansion. Since most international markets present a number of difficulties, such as different local business practices and customer preferences, the franchisor gains from the local knowledge and, and the knowledge of local customer preferences that the franchisee would have. There are benefits for the franchisee as well. Upon entering such an agreement, the franchisee acquires the expertise of the franchisor in the manufacture of such goods or the provision of these services without having to learn this by itself. The franchisee can also, on the basis of the franchise system, set up outlets with a greater chance of success than if it had to do it alone. Before a franchisor and a franchisee enters into a franchise agreement, there are certain other documents that are circulated and signed. The first of these is a confidentiality agreement or an NDA. This is typically to protect the confidential information that is usually passing from the franchisor to the franchisee. The second is an application form or a questionnaire that seeks information from the franchisee to the franchisor. The third is usually an information document about the franchisor, how successful it has been, what would be unique about the franchise opportunity, and in what circumstances would the franchise be provided to potential franchisees. With, as with all of these documents, a lot depends on whether this is fit for your particular context and the particular situation in which you find yourselves as a franchisee. As with everything, do keep in mind that every single legal arrangement that you enter into, you would be best advised to consult with a legal professional in the jurisdiction in which you want to enter into such an agreement. I hope you found this presentation beneficial. I've certainly enjoyed presenting. We'll have a short question and answer session now. If you have any questions, please feel free to type out the questions and I'll try and answer them as much as possible. The next few slides will give you a bit of a background about Collier Law, uh, our mission statement, 
our practice areas, our industry sectors, and some of the experience of the team in the recent past. All right, everyone. So we can now proceed with the Q&A portion of our session. Our speaker, Mr. Hake, is here with us. So if you have any questions, you may now type in those in the Q&A tab at the right side of your screen um, beside the polls. So I can see some people already type in um, their questions. So if you're ready, uh, Mr. Hake, do we um, start with the first question here? Yeah, sure. Um, we can start with the first one. Um, I think the first one is uh, in relation to, uh, let me just try and find it. It's about uh, termination. Um, what are the typical provisions that, uh, that, that follow the termination of the franchise contract? <clears throat> and so I think, I guess, you, you know, you look at it from two perspectives. You look at it from the franchisor's perspective, and, and then you have to look at it from the franchisee's perspective, what the obligations that are applicable to each. Um, for the former, you know, the franchisor is primarily interested in ensuring that his intellectual property, uh, which has been licensed to the franchisee uh, in connection with the franchise agreement, uh, is not continued to be used. <clears throat> uh, this is, of course, very important because upon termination of the co contract, the franchisor may want to you know, either seize operations uh, of that franchise uh, in that jurisdiction, it may want to grant that franchise contract to someone else, uh, you know, maybe to a competitor of the franchisee. And therefore, it's very important that uh, the trademarks that are associated with that franchise are, uh, you know, are given back, you know, are destroyed if they're required to be destroyed. And certainly there's a contractual obligation to not continue to use those trademarks. So that will be one of the key ones from the franchisor's perspective. The second big one from the franchisor's perspective is, is, of course, to receive any payments that are due until such point of time that the contract is terminated. Mm -hmm. and, and these are essentially payments that are under the franchise contract in terms of royalties or service fees uh, for, for, for really compensating the franchisor for having invested uh, you know, uh, time in training, uh, time in sort of basically teaching the franchisee how to run the franchise in that jurisdiction. From the franchisee's point of view, um, I suppose it's primarily interested in post-termination restraints. Uh, the typical post-termination restraints are uh, non-compete or non-solicitation, uh, and, and that would essentially prevent the franchisee from uh, trying to do a similar business uh, you know, to that of the franchise concept uh, on its own, uh, or maybe sometimes in combination with another franchisor who is a competitor of the uh, of the initial franchisor. So that will that, sort of be the main concern of the franchisee to try and prevent that. Uh, and that covers the first question. Great. So the next question was here. What are the types of continuing support that the franchise should provide to the franchisee at the beginning of the franchise arrangement? Yeah, so at, at the beginning of the franchise arrangement, it's really important that the franchisee is, is really able to uh, have the right training uh, and the right resources uh, to really understand uh, how to properly undertake the franchise system in his particular territory. And, and this can be, of course, you know, uh, imported in several ways. We've talked about the operating manual. The operating manual is a really important part uh, of the franchise system because it sets out uh, you know, the rules that are to be followed, the procedures that are required uh, to be maintained uh, to really make the franchise concept work. So, I mean, there's this little anecdote about how, uh, you know, uh, the, the I, I forget which fast food chain it was, but it is one of the fast food chains where the operating manual actually specifies that if a customer were to drop his drink uh, or were to drop his tray on the ground, uh, everyone... Uh, I mean, everyone who's, who's a, a sub staff member should simply say, uh, sorry, that happened, sir. Here's your burger again, or, you know, here's your drink that you dropped. 
to basically, without any questions, replace that drink uh, or that or that burger immediately free of charge. And, and it's really important because you know that sort of sets the culture. It sort of sets the uh, you know the, the look and feel of the place. And uh, a large part of the success of a franchise is really based on of that that consumer experience, right? And 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 the, the look and feel of that uh, experience. Uh, and, and you must put that down in a very clear and understandable manner in the operating manual. One of the other continuing obligations of the franchisor would be to to really uh, gauge and you know after having tested the market to really gauge the consumer sentiment uh, to see is the franchise working uh, you know in in its original form. Uh, give you another good example of this is you know if you look at a, a large global uh, franchise or like McDonald's. Uh, they actually fundamentally modified their approach in India, taking into account, uh, you know, I think two aspects. It's one large part of the country doesn't have beef, uh, and an, another large part of the country is, is sort of, uh, you know, very focused on certain types of Indian food uh, and Indian spices. So they have they have actually suitably modified the menu in McDonald's in India, uh, which is not just a fast food franchise. It's it, it's a it's a family experience. That's how they. They've marketed it as well, so they've, they've they've understood that the local market is different, and they have managed to make those tweaks uh, to the uh, to effectively even the business model, I would say, but largely to the uh, operating manual, manual uh, and and in terms of you know the look and feel of, of the franchise concept to take into account the local taste, uh, you know, local customer preferences. Uh, sometimes it's business practices that are different. Uh, so if you if you include all of these. Uh, and, 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 and the franchise, I was really able to uh, feel the pulse of, uh, of the local market uh, for the franchise concept. Uh, I think the franchise is going to be a lot more successful uh, than simply trying to import uh, the original concept, lock, stock and barrel, without making the necessary modifications for the local market. Perfect. So I guess that's it for the Q&A part of our session. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for your time. And thank you very much for our speaker, Mr. Hake, for the wonderful and very informative um, information you have given us. So bye, thank everyone. You. See you in the next session.